natural disasters and man-made catastrophes and with them the tragic loss of life, devastation, suffering and hardship. Earthquakes, volcanoes, meteorites, sometimes it's the awesome power of nature in action. War, industrial accidents, the spread of disease, the folly and greed of mankind can be as deadly as anything else on this planet. In desperate hours, we look back at the most noteworthy disasters of the last 100 years. This episode of Desperate Hours is all about disasters at sea. The long saga of death and misadventure at sea is as much a record of human folly as it is of nature's fury. The Suwol ferry disaster took place on what must have seemed like any other ordinary day. The passengers included 325 high school students on a field trip from Danwon High School. As well as the ill-fated high school children, there were also regular passengers and commuters. After all, the Suwol ferry took the same route around the southwest coast of South Korea from Incheon to Jeju three times a week. Little could any of the passengers have known that day they were all setting sail on board a death trap. About halfway through its journey, the ferry simply capsized, tipped over on its side and began filling up with water. The captain and crew ordered passengers to stay where they were. It's not clear to this day why, but it was a decision that condemned hundreds to a watery grave. But why had the Suol ferry tipped? It turns out the passenger's ferry was carrying double its limit in cargo. It may have been over by as much as 2,000 tons. Not only that, a lot of the overflow in cargo was not properly secured. Water began pouring in and the cargo in the ship began to tumble and fall, injuring passengers and blocking their way out. And still, the captain and his crew told passengers to remain in their cabins. When the Suol went down, it took 304 souls with her to the ocean floor. Of the 172 survivors, more than half were rescued by fishing boats and other commercial vessels that arrived at the scene 40 minutes following the South Korean Coast Guard. The skipper of the Suol ferry was the 69-year-old captain, Lee Yoon Siak, who had been brought in as a replacement for the regular captain. Lee had been at sea for more than 40 years, however, and was familiar with the route. It's hard to come to any other conclusion other than that he had behaved disgracefully. At his original trial, 75 of the survivors took the stand to tell how they were ordered to stay in their cabins while Lee and some of the crew got to safety as fast as they could. Captain Lee and his inner circle would all languish in jail for a while. Lee Yun Siak is still there, serving a life sentence for murder by criminal neglect. The recovery efforts went on for days, though it soon became apparent more survivors were unlikely. In all, the bodies of nine of those lost at sea have never been recovered. 
In Korea's Confucian culture, great importance is placed on holding a ceremony to mark the end of a life. Some parents in Danwon would be denied that privilege. It was a cold night in September 1994 when the 20.3-ton passenger ship left the Estonian port capital city of Tallinn. The ferry Estonia was on its way to Stockholm when it got caught in a storm, capsized and sunk, condemning 850 people to a watery grave. The official explanation was that locks on the bow door, the door to the ship's hold, had failed under the strain of the storm. Thus, the door separated from the rest of the vessel, pulling ajar the ramp behind it and allowing water into the vessel deck. The ship's officers and crew came in for criticism this time too. They didn't slow down when they heard noises coming from below, and nobody seemed to think of checking the vehicle deck. Trucks perhaps weren't uh, weren't properly tied down or something, and that and that maybe there was because of the rough seas, the the cars and the trucks were shifting around in the boat. As we said, an unlocked bow door was the official explanation for the sinking of the SS Estonia. But spend just a little time reading about the incident, and you will find not only conspiracy theorists but qualified experts who suggest the accident might have actually been a case of sabotage, an inside job, and something to do with the military cargo the ship was carrying on that fateful voyage. Perhaps we'll never know for sure. But now for the maritime disaster that practically everyone knows something about. Did you know, however, the Titanic was conceived and built as a series of three so-called wonder ships? There was the Titanic, the Olympic, and the Gigantic. The luxury passenger liner, the Titanic, first came off the line in 1911. Some 269 meters long and 53 meters high, the Titanic had a crew of around 900. It was a luxury passenger liner that carried some of the world's richest people in first class on the upper and middle deck, but plenty more in steerage class, looking for a new life in North America. The intended course on the Titanic's maiden voyage was from Southampton, England, to New York City. The Titanic left Southampton on April 10, 1912. But of course, as we all know, the Titanic collided with an iceberg and sank on April 15, 1912. While the mighty ocean liner carried over 2,208 people and interestingly had enough life jackets for everyone, they simply didn't have enough lifeboats. Moreover, in the quite understandable panic and disorder, some silly things happened such as a 64-person lifeboat leaving with just 28 on board. All in all, 1,503 people lost their lives. The salvaging of the wreck continues to this day. Every survivor of the Titanic, in a sense, owed their lives to advances in radio communications. It was the distress call on the ship's radio that brought the Cunard cruise ship, the Carpathia, to the scene. By the time they arrived, the Titanic had sunk, but there were still 705 survivors in lifeboats waiting for them. 
Britain's postmaster general at the time went on record as saying, those who have been saved have been saved through one man, Mr. Marconi and his marvelous invention, radio. This is Marconi himself after he traveled to New York to meet with some of the survivors. The wreck of the Titanic sits on the seabed over three and a half thousand meters below the water's surface. Through the looking glass of history, it may be tempting to pass judgments on the causes of the Titanic, but more recent events stand up to closer scrutiny. It seems pretty clear cut, for example, that the Exxon Valdez oil spill was a tragedy that could have been avoided. The supertanker, the Exxon Valdez, ran aground in Alaska on Bly Reef, ruptured and proceeded to spill 11 million gallons of crude oil into Alaska's Prince William Sound. Some 1,300 miles of coastline was blighted and polluted. Hundreds of thousands of birds and marine animals were killed. According to the U.S. National Wildlife Federation, possibly as many as 250,000 seabirds over 2,800 sea otters, some 300 harbor seals, and 250 bald eagles were killed almost immediately. There were heartbreaking scenes of animals covered in oil trying to clean their bodies by licking themselves, only to die from the toxins in the oil. 22 orcas, killer whales, died of hypothermia and nobody knows how many fish. Smaller organisms, of course, were killed by the trillion, leaving the animals which in turn preyed upon them without a source of food. The accident took place after the ship's captain bungled his duties. For one thing, it seems he'd already drunk five double vodkas before leaving the bridge at a critical moment. The consequences of this bad decision-making were far-reaching, not only for the environment, but the local fishing industry and native subsistence hunting were also put out of business, crippled for several years after. In 1994, the Exxon Oil Company was ordered by a federal court to pay $5 billion in punitive damages. Court appeals by Exxon and a ruling by the United States Supreme Court further reduced damages to just over 500 million. In real terms, however, it is estimated that around $2 billion has been spent on cleanup and recovery. In the first year of a nervous new century, on the 26th of September 2000, the MS Express Samina set sail from the port of Piraeus in Attica, Greece, with 470 passengers and 61 crew. A little after 10 that evening, two nautical miles from their destination, the MS Express Samina hit the Portes Islets while traveling at a speed of 18 knots. It didn't help matters that a gale was blowing at the time. The Portes Islets mark the northern boundaries of some low-lying islands. The gates themselves, you would think, should have been easy enough to miss. One is some 25 meters high, with a navigational light that can be seen up to 12 kilometers away. The problem was, the Semina was effectively running on autopilot. The bridge had been deserted, with the captain and his first mate elsewhere, watching a replay of a local football match. An investigation was to reveal. I looked up and I saw that there were lights, so I thought we must be there. And um, I went to stand up to, you know, just 
see that because I saw the shore, I figured we were close, and immediately I looked here and, and I heard the crash and there was a rock. When the ship hit the reef, it lurched portside and power was immediately cut. So much for the football replay. Everyone on board was reduced to fumbling in the dark, trying to locate rafts and life jackets as the express Samina began its descent. Nobody took charge, nobody gave directions. It wasn't like exit to the left or anything, you know, organized at all. It was just like running and bumping into people, people falling down, people getting trampled. The ship took around 45 minutes to sink, during which time help from the crew was conspicuously absent. They seemed to have taken the attitude, everyone for themselves. A far cry from the women and children first ethos of the Titanic. 82 of the 533 passengers on board perished. The first responders to the distress call included the British Navy in the area due to a NATO exercise. Their actions were some of the few honorable maneuvers of the entire sad affair. It must seem like ship's captains and crew are being singled out on this episode. Not at all. The truth, of course, is most of them behave honorably when called upon to do their duty. How very, very proud we are of this crew and uh, the captain. And uh, we are very, very proud of our United States Navy and uh, the actions that they did to, to rescue their captain. Captain, we're proud of you. We really are. We're proud of you. That would be Captain Richard Phillips, of course, captain of the merchant vessel Maersk, Alabama, during its hijacking by Somali pirates in 2009. Captain Phillips' actions were of course deemed so heroic, they made a movie starring Tom Hanks about it. So then, as we look for a hero, what about Captain Sven Erik Pedersen, the skipper of the Seaborn Spirit? This was a cruise ship attacked by pirates back in 2005. The Seaborn Spirit was on its way to Mombasa, the final port of call after a 16-night cruise from Alexandria. Complete with marble-tiled bathrooms, the 10,000-ton luxury cruise liner also boasted more than one member of crew for every passenger on board. Pirates blasted away at the luxury liner with a rocket-propelled grenade launcher and machine gun fire. We heard some shots and the captain made an announcement in every cabin that uh, we should stay in our cabin, that we were being attacked by pirates. It was extremely frightening, many of us, me including, so the boats um, and the pirates from our cabin, and the next thing, the grenade blew up. So um, you never know within your cabin. Piracy has made a comeback, and we don't just mean in the movies. And according to the International Maritime Bureau, the most pirate-infested waters are around the Somali coast. The Dutch Navy frigate is escorting a convoy of aid to Somalia and making sure it isn't seized by pirates along the way.
Last but not least in this episode, a recent maritime mishap that would almost be comic were it not for the needless loss of life. That would be the Costa Concordia. In January 2012, 32 people were killed when the Mediterranean cruise ship ran aground. With over 3,000 passengers and more than 1,000 crew, the ship was just beginning a week-long cruise. On the first night of the cruise, as the ship headed northwest along the Italian coastline, Captain Francesco Scatino ordered the ship to be steered off its chartered course to sail close to Giglio Island. It was a costly gesture, to put it mildly. While traveling at a rate of 16 knots, the Costa Concordia hit a rocky outcrop of the island. With the hole now on its left-hand side, the Concordia began taking on water and rapidly began to tilt. The engine rooms were soon flooded and the power was cut. All the passengers were running up and down. And then we, we went to our cabins to, to know, get to know what, what's going on. And then they said that we should stay, stay calm. It's, it's nothing, it's just an electrical problem or just some blackout thing. But the ship was already tilted, so you can imagine the ship already like this. Soon the Concordia was listing so badly that a number of lifeboats could not be launched. Some of the fitter passengers took matters into their own hands, jumping into the ocean and swimming the 300 meters or so to Giglio Island. And what of Captain Scatino? Soon after the ship smashed into the rocks, he ordered the Coast Guard to be informed that the Concordia had suffered nothing more than a blackout and their assistance was not required. And as the media was quick to report, he also claimed to have tripped and fell into a lifeboat. In February 2015, the Concordia's captain was found guilty of manslaughter, causing a shipwreck and abandoning a ship before his passengers. He is currently appealing a 16-year jail sentence and may never see the inside of a prison cell. The Concordia was towed to Genoa to be scrapped in a 100 million euro operation expected to take around two years. There are a couple of interesting footnotes to this sorry tale. Investigations into the sinking of the Concordia have revealed the doomed cruise ship was carrying a huge shipment of cocaine in its hold. When you start chartering a course through the choppy seas of maritime disasters, the effect can be quite sobering. From the sinking of the Titanic, a supposedly unsinkable luxury liner, to a routine ferry trip in South Korea that ended with the heartbreaking loss of so many young lives or the Exxon Valdez oil spill, which pumped millions of gallons of crude oil into Prince William Sound, Alaska, one of the last pristine environments in the world. Then there's the return of piracy to the high seas, a clear and ever-present danger. The old saying, worst things happen at sea, turns out to be really true.